I'm going to speak about molecular dynamics approach to rational design of functionalized nanoparticles for cancer treatment. And I want to start with a statement which we all probably read somewhere in the introduction of most nanoparticle related papers, and that is the use of the nanoparticles as drug delivery vehicles shows great potential. And that is absolutely true. Nanoparticles are extremely versatile, there are vast possibilities for customization, and they have wide range of desirable properties, which we can see from the list, although I'm aware that uh, I'm certain that we are all aware uh, of the advantages. However, while all of this is true, there is only a small number of clinically approved nanoparticles and the simplicity of the design of those nanoparticles uh, do not reflect the complexity found in literature, meaning that the potential of the nanoparticles is not yet fully exploited. And why is that so? Unfortunately, there is no one definite answer and there are many factors that contribute to this issue. However, one part of the explanation might be a gap in the prevailing conceptual uh, framework guiding nanocarrier design. Uh, approach to design has mostly been uh, empirical. For example, uh, we want to find a way to improve the delivery of this highly hydrophobic uh, drug. So in order to design a perfect nanocarrier, uh, we need to think about all the possible obstacles this drug encounters in vivo and then how to overcome those obstacles. And we need to make a series of decisions, starting with what type of nanoparticle we want to use, what will be the shape, the size. Then we need to think how can we incorporate this drug into our system. And there are multiple ways of doing so. In this example, we chose to covalently bind this drug to this ligand. Uh, however, we can also try to encapsulate the drug. Uh, since the drug is hydrophobic, we need to think of a way to increase the solubility, so we might want to incorporate hydrophilic background ligand. We might want to reduce non-specific interactions with proteins, so we need to find a way to do that. So basically what we are doing, we are thinking about all the possible issues, what kind of physical chemical properties our systems should have in order to overcome those obstacles. And then we need to find molecules which have those properties to functionalize our nanoparticle. And most of these decisions are based empirically. They are based on our previous knowledge and uh, our, on our previous experience. Uh, and so far, there is no set of rules or generalized guidelines that, can, that we can rely on while making this decision. Uh, once we made all of these decisions, uh, we can try to draw our structure just to visualize the design we came up with. And we do this uh, based on our knowledge of the atoms, uh, bonds that they can make with uh, other atoms, length of those bonds, angles, and so on. And once we uh, assembly, assemble us, our systems, we get this really nice looking nanoparticle. Uh, however, uh, Although this is the best estimate we can get at this point, uh, this uh, structure is not real, meaning this nanoparticle might look like this in a vacuum, uh, but we know that once we put it in a solution or administer it in vivo, this structure might change due to various interactions, and the change in the structure can affect its function. So how will it look like? It's really difficult to predict in advance, or maybe even impossible, uh, just because uh, sheer number of the parameters we need to take into account. For example, we need to consider physical chemical properties of all these molecules, how they interact among themselves and how they interact with their environment. Uh, if we did take into account all of these interactions, we can get, oh, I'm so sorry, a structure that looks like this, which is quite different for, from our initial idea. Uh, although the composition of the nanoparticle did not change. So from experimental point of view, how can we get the information about the structure of the nanoparticle? Well, first we actually need to synthesize the nanoparticle and then we need to perform physical chemical characterization, maybe perform some in vitro tests. And if we are, we are not satisfied with the design or with the efficacy, we take a step back, introduce some modification and then synthesize it again and then test it again and go back and forwards. And this approach takes time and energy and uh, I'm sure uh, patience and also costs quite a lot. 
And the one thing that can help uh, with this approach is the use of computation, computational methods, uh, such as uh, molecular dynamics. So molecular dynamics became one of the principal tools in the theoretical study of the biomolecules. And I won't go into details because I think I only have uh, five minutes left. Uh, so I will just give a brief overview. Uh, so by using the knowledge of underlying physics and chemistry, uh, or to be more precise, uh, given the knowledge of the structure of the molecules and interactions among them, we can get insight into structures they form, how they move with respect to each other with time, and get a three-dimensional movie of what is happening on atomistic scale. So we can investigate the structure, dynamics, and thermodynamics of these systems on the scale which is mostly inaccessible by experiments, and we can do it much quicker and cheaper since we don't use actual chemicals or different instruments. And also we can use the fact that we can simulate a large number of systems uh, to extract these generalized rules that can help and guide the synthesis. And that is a long term uh, aim. And here I'll present some preliminary results which we published. Uh, so we focused on mixed monolayer gold nanoparticles and we simulated two types of systems. So in one system it was designed to carry small hydrophobic drug quinolinol, which is colored red. And the other system uh, was carrying the larger hydrophilic drug panobinostat, which is colored pink. Uh, aim was to investigate how do physical chemical properties of the drug and some properties of the ligand affect the structure in a solution. So to do that uh, throughout the simulations, we changed only two parameters. So we changed either the used drug while keeping the background ligand same and also the ligand which carries the drug or uh, we simulated the same system but varied the ratio uh, of these ligands in the system to see whether the initial concentration of these ligands uh, has an effect on the structure. And here we see uh, the results for quinolinol systems. Uh, these pictures are snapshots from five different simulations. Ligand, which carries the drug, is colored gray. Uh, quinolinol, the drug is colored red and the background ligand is colored blue. Uh, background ligand is hydrophilic and it has citerionic terminal end, which is colored dark blue, just for easier visualization. And each snapshot represents different ratio of these ligands. So from the left to the right, we start with um, high initial concentration of the ligand which carries the drug. So the ratio of that ligand to background ligand is three to one. And we gradually change that ratio until we get to the far right when black, uh, background ligand is in excess and the ratio of the ligand which carries the drug to background ligand is one to three. So even visually, so when we're observing these snapshots, we can see a trend. Uh, as we increase the initial concentration of the ligand that carries the drug, we can see the higher amount of the drug accessible on the surface. However, even the highest initial concentration of the ligand that carries the drug, we can see that this surface is more gray than red, which means that the ligand is actually exposed at the surface rather than the drug. Drug gets uh, hidden under the surface. And uh, if we pay attention to the blue color, which represents the background ligand, we can see that it uh, dominates the surface and we can assume that our drug is hidden somewhere between. And this is confirmed by uh, radial distribution function uh, and also by the calculated percentage of the accessible drug. So explanation for this can be the hydrophobicity of the drug. Since it tends to decrease its surface area in contact with the solvent, it bends the entire ligand towards the gold core. Uh, by doing that, it, it exposes more hydrophilic part of the chain to the solvent and lets the background ligand uh, extend outwards, uh, covering the drug beneath. Uh, we wanted to see to what extent the drug is covered beneath the surface. And as we can see from the table percentage which is available to the solvent is quite low. So it goes up to 20% and it would be difficult to increase this percentage more uh, because we could compromise the solubility of the entire systems. Oh, so sorry. Uh, here we have uh, panobinostat systems. So as in the previous examples, uh, background ligand is still colored blue because we use the same one. Ligand that carries the drug is colored gray because we use the same one. 
uh, and the panobinoester, the drug is colored pink. Uh, comparing with quinolinal system, we can observe the same trend. So as we increase the initial concentration of the drug, the more of it appears on the surface. And due to hydrophilicity of this drug, the higher amount is available comparing to quinolinal systems. But what's interesting here is that despite the hydrophilicity of the drug and the ligand and the voluminosity of panobinoestat system and the fact that background ligand is significantly shorter uh, than the ligand which carries the drug, by looking at the radial distribution function and the percentages calculated here, we can see that some uh, percentage of the drug is still hidden below, uh, below the surface. Uh, here we compared theoretical values of uh, average nanoparticle size and average coating thickness. Uh, since the deviation in the results can uh, explain the impact of the parameters that we couldn't take uh, into account in advance, so prior to the simulations. And we can observe an interesting trend, and that is that deviations increase as we increase the hydrophobicity of the system. And this is true for every analysis that we performed. On this slide, uh, okay, uh, we can see uh, simulations of quinolinal systems. So we didn't change the composition, just vary the ratio. And we can see that we obtained quite different structures. And that is true for both hydrophobic and for hydrophilic systems. So we can conclude that initial concentration of the ligands or the ratio of the ligands and the hydrophob their hydrophobicity probably have the highest impact on the overall structure. So the tendency of the hydrophobic ligands to decrease their surface accessible to the solvent results in bending of the whole ligand, which changes surface morphology. It also decreases overall nanoparticle size and coating thickness. And to what extent the structure will be changed depends on the initial concentration of the ligands, because uh, the number and the type of interactions will change. Uh, length of the ligand is of secondary importance, and we saw that uh, both on the example of hydrophobic and hydrophilic drug, because although background ligand was shorter in both cases, it still ended up covering a uh, good part of the surface. Uh, additional experiments are needed here to confirm this, since uh, ligands that we used here have some degree of flexibility, and it would be quite interesting to see what happens if the ligands are more rigid in nature. Uh, however, as mentioned, additional simulations are planned and some are currently ongoing. But what can we see from preliminary results is that these trend lines can be extracted. And with sufficient number of simulations, maybe we can extract useful guidelines uh, to ease up the process of the synthesis. So with simulation complementing the wet experiments, uh, we can get a step closer to more systemic and informed uh, nanomedicine design. Uh, I thank you for your attention and again apologize for my issues um, with the microphone. Thank you very much. We have time for one question. Uh, Ivana, please. Uh, yes, thank you, Marina, for this uh, interesting talk. Uh, I have uh, two questions, very short. So first one is, the which uh, software did you use uh, for calculation? And uh, the second one, uh, did you uh, ever try to, to run molecular dynamics uh, with some uh, metal-based uh, nanosystems? Uh, okay, thank you for your questions. Uh, for simulations, I used Ember software. And as for analysis, uh, I used both Ember and VMD. But also, we made some uh, custom Python scripts in order to analyze the data from the trajectories. Uh, as for uh, simulations, what we've done so far is only with gold nanoparticles. Uh, but plan for the future is to extend uh, the choice of the nanoparticles used for the simulations. And, and, and when you uh, when you worked with gold nanoparticles, so you constructed like a, a spherical or you used the, the like a, a surface, just surface with some uh, we approximated this, so we didn't uh, make them uh, completely spherical because that's not uh, possible in reality. We uh, constructed it as dodecahedron. So to approximate the sphere, but uh, again, not exactly because the idea is to mimic what happens in reality and in reality, the perfect sphere is not possible. 
And, and how long did it take to run uh, a simulation? Uh, uh, I mean, like in how many uh, weeks? <laughs> okay, so uh, for me, uh, I simulated 300 nanoseconds uh, and it took for between uh, maybe five and seven days, but it really depends on the hardware and on the, on the number of simulations that we are performing at the same time. So if I uh, run only one simulation, it goes significantly faster than if I try to perform more. And since uh, the aim here is to perform a large number of simulations so we can get a lot of data and extract some uh, useful guidelines from that, uh, it goes slowly. <laughs> so it takes weeks and even months. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Marina. Thank you so much for the questions. Thank you again.